lives saved and the human suffering reduced. 20 years ago, telling a positive result of HIV test to a patient was equivalent to declaring a death sentence. Those days are remembered for daily funeral ceremony of young and productive age group of our population, hospital beds full of HIV AIDS patients, orphan children in every village. Nowadays, the story has changed and people with HIV are living longer and quality life. In fact, we are progressing towards realization of an HIV-free generation. The rapid scale-up of ART program in Ethiopia has shown a dramatic decline of days from 117.7 per 100,000 in 2001 to 11.73 in per 100,000 in 2020. Compared to the 2010 level, there is a 52% reduction in AIDS days in 2019. Similar to the HIV AIDS program, the Global Fund has made huge investment on tuberculosis and malaria prevention and control program during the last two decades. In Ethiopia, the incidence of tuberculosis has declined with annual average of 8 to 9 percent from 421 per 100,000 in 2000 to 140 per 100,000 population in 2019. 80 percent reduction of malaria-related mortality has been registered in Ethiopia as well. Recently, Ethiopia has planned to achieve nationwide malaria elimination by 2030 by starting subnational elimination in districts with low malaria transmission. In addition to the life-saving investment in these diseases, the Global Fund has immense contribution in creating strong health systems, which include expanding infrastructure like health centers, health posts, pharmaceutical supply warehouses, supporting training of skilled health workers, investing on availing reliable health information, and strong logistic system to deliver quality health care. Finally, extending my sincere appreciation to the continued support of the Global Fund, I call upon the global community to continue to support the Global Fund to maintain the gains achieved over the last 20 years and ensure universal access to everyone in the world. I thank you. At this year's United Nations high-level meeting on HIV, we celebrate the great progress we made against the virus. 20 years ago, HIV seemed unbeatable. But over the course of two decades, global solidarity has turned the tide against the virus. One of the game-changing moments on that trajectory was the creation of the Global Fund. Together with partners, the Global Fund galvanized global solidarity, political leadership, and investments against the pandemic. That led to swift gains. Deaths from AIDS-related causes peaked in 2004 and have since fallen by 60% worldwide. To mark the Global Fund's 20th anniversary this year, we celebrate the people, the partners, the advocates, and the communities whose hard work and determination have led to this remarkable success. We also recognize the enormous challenges we still face in our efforts to end AIDS. Structural and social inequities, stigma and discrimination continue to fuel HIV. COVID-19 has knocked our progress even further off course. 20 years ago, in June 2001, the United Nations General Assembly convened the first special session dedicated to HIV and AIDS, adding great momentum to the fight against the virus. 20 years on, the need for global solidarity and urgent action has never been greater. The clock is ticking. We have eight years to meet the 2030 deadline to end AIDS. We faced challenges before, but we know that if we can continue to fight inequity, Well, good afternoon and welcome to our CSI campus here in unfortunately a very wet and cold Dublin, particularly apologizing to our overseas visitors. Uh, those of you watching online can uh, just uh, 
lean back and enjoy the warmth of your office or your uh, or your uh, wherever you're watching this from. It is uh, a real pleasure uh, for me as president of RCSI uh, to open this uh, short uh, session in conversation with the Global Fund. Uh, the Global Fund is celebrating 20 years since it was established to fight the deadliest pandemics confronting humanity, HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria. The outcome has been a monumental collective effort and the fund has invested an astonishing 53 billion US dollars since its inception and currently it invests approximately 4 billion US dollars a year. More importantly, the result has been an estimated saving of over 40 million lives, halving the death rates of these three diseases in the countries in which the Global Fund invests. And the fund aims at ending these pandemics by 2030. A lofty aim indeed, but one that might well be in sight as long as there is political stability in both donor and recipient countries. And in that context, the last couple of weeks have been very worrying indeed. In 2017, RCSI had the pleasure of welcoming the then Global Fund Executive Director uh, Mark Diebull to the college. And this afternoon, we are delighted to welcome Peter Sands, Executive Director, and Grace Ngubli. I hope I pronounced it, Grace, who is uh, a council member of the Global Fund Youth Council, and she comes from Malawi. This event has been organized by the RCSI Institute of Global Surgery uh, under the leadership of Professor Mark Schreim in collaboration with Irish Aid and the Irish Global Health Network. And I would like to acknowledge and welcome our friends and partners from both organizations. Ireland is a founding partner and strong supporter of the Global Fund, contributing over 256 million euro to date and indeed Ireland's support is increasing in commitment in keeping with our commitment to reach a target of 0.7 percent of gross national income for developmental assistance. A global approach to health is central to the RCSI mission of leading the world to better health. Our values are to educate, nurture and discover for the benefit of human health. And we are enriched by the diversity of our student population, our staff and faculty, and our overseas campuses. We are proudly ranked second amongst world academic institutions for contribution to Sustainable Development Goal 3, Good Health and Wellbeing. And I want to particularly also today acknowledge our friends and colleagues from COSEXA who have traveled so far to be with us on this important occasion. We are a highly active in global health research, education and innovation, working with our partners in low resource settings on numerous programs and particularly with COSEXA. The Institute of Global Surgery works through partnerships to provide access to safe, affordable and timely surgical care for those who need it most. With these few words of welcome, I would like to invite Professor Mark Schreim, O'Brien Chair of Global Surgery in RCSI, to introduce our speakers and to moderate the symposium. Mark. Thank you all for being here. Before I introduce our speakers, a little bit of housekeeping. Our two speakers will speak back to back, so I'm going to, I'm going to introduce them together. they will speak back to back and then there'll be time for questions and answer in a roundtable format uh, right here. We have some questions that have been pre-submitted, but please feel free to ask your questions. There'll be people roving the halls with microphones uh, for you to be able to ask your questions. With that housekeeping, let me introduce Peter Sams, who's been the executive director for the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria since March of 2018. 
Since June of 2015, Peter has been a research fellow at Harvard University, dividing his time between the Mosavar Rahmani Center for Business and Government at the Kennedy School and the Harvard Global Health Institute. Peter was group CEO of Standard Chartered from November 2006 to June 2015, having joined the board of Standard Chartered as group CFO in May 2002. He has served on various boards and commissions, including the UK's Department of Health, the World Economic Forum, and the International Advisory Board of the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Following Peter's talk, Grace Glube will be speaking. She is the Global Fund Youth Council member, as well as a board member for the National Association for Young People Living with HIV in Malawi, and the founder of Youth Health Connect 360. Grace is also an advocate and youth champion for sexual and reproductive health and HIV, and is the Her Voice Ambassador for Malawi. Dutch Sands. Thank you, Mark, and also thank you, Professor O'Connell, and thank you to the RSCI, to Irish Aid, and the Global Health Network for inviting us um, for this event today. It is, as Professor O'Connell said, the 20th anniversary of the creation of the Global Fund, and it was quite an extraordinary moment that brought together what might seem quite an unlikely group of characters. It was Kofi Annan, it was George W. Bush, it was Jack Chirac, um, Bill Gates, who came together to create this new institution, not part of the UN, a unique public-private partnership at a time when HIV AIDS in particular was exploding out of control. And since then, it has been an extraordinary story. Over 44 million lives have been saved. The death toll across the three diseases, although still far too high, has been roughly halved. But COVID-19 has arrested that progress. In 2020, for the first time in our history, we saw metrics of progress, reductions in infections, numbers of people enrolled in treatment. For the first time across all three diseases, we saw reversals. We saw years of hard-won gains being pushed back. HIV testing fell by 22%. The numbers of people being reached by HIV prevention services fell by 11%. Actually, the numbers of people on antiretroviral treatment actually went up, and that reflected massive efforts by everybody in the HIV AIDS community to ensure that we didn't interrupt treatment. But we will pay the price for the disruption of, pre of prevention services. It will take more time to flow through, but we know we will pay the price. TB, we saw a pretty dramatic impact. In 2020, a million less people in the world were diagnosed for treatment and treated for TB than had been diagnosed and treated in 2019. And although the deaths only went, only, only went up, by 100,000 to 1.5 million in 2020, we know that number is going to go up in 21. TB takes longer to kill people than, say, malaria. And the job of getting TB back on track, and it was of the three diseases we fight, the one that we have made least progress on, is, is a massive undertaking. And then malaria. Malaria is a disease where things change very quickly. We had a 13% increase in deaths, and that was largely due to COVID-19, and mainly children under the age of five and pregnant women. And, and the reasons for that, um, actually, it wasn't that bed net campaigns were disrupted. We actually distributed more bed nets in 
2020 than we had ever done before because we made a massive effort because we knew the treatment services would get disrupted. But it was because with malaria, everything is around what happens in the first 72 hours, um, particularly with the young children. And if your community health worker was sick or dealing with COVID, uh, they weren't available. It could have been much worse though. And the fact that it wasn't worse is due to the fact that right across the partnership, communities, civil society organizations, development partners, governments actually move very rapidly when COVID struck. And at the Global Fund, we, we pivoted pretty rapidly to working out how we could support countries respond to this pandemic. And to give you a sense of the magnitude, uh, as the professor said, we deploy about $4 billion a year fighting HIV, TB and malaria. During the course of the pandemic, we have deployed another, on top of that, $4.2 billion helping countries respond to COVID-19 and mitigate the impact on the three diseases. Twenty twenty two is going to be uh, a challenging year as we're all discovering. Um, one is we are not through COVID nineteen. I know in many countries in the world the sort of psychology is that we want to get on with our lives, very natural, and that we want to move on. I, I'm not sure the virus has quite read that script. Um, the virus will continue to evolve. And we may be lucky and we may not be lucky. Uh, one thing we do know, though, is that vaccines are not going to be a silver bullet that are going to remove it. We're going to have to live with this virus. And the other thing that's very clear is that due to the inequities in distribution of vaccines and other tools, that many countries, the populations are still very vulnerable. And Omicron may, it's too often repeated that it is kind of a milder version. It depends what your benchmark is. It's still perfectly capable of killing large numbers of people and of overwhelming health systems. So that's one challenge we have. The second challenge we have is we have to get back on track against HIV, TB and malaria. The world has committed to ending these three diseases as public health threats by 2030 but we're not remotely on track. And indeed, having had two years of either going backwards or stalling, we have to achieve much steeper trajectories of reductions in deaths and infections if we are to have any hope of achieving that ambition. And then also there is the imperative to make sure that the world is better protected against future threats. Uh, I think COVID has shown us pretty dramatically that we weren't well protected. But it's not like these three things are different things. The reality is most of what you need to do to fight one big nasty infectious disease is very closely correlated with what you need to do to fight another one or to fight a future one. And a lot of that comes down to the systems, the capacities of the underlying health systems, lab networks with trained technicians and the right sort of equipment, supply chains that can deliver goods even to the last mile, primary health care facilities, the public health capabilities that allow you to conduct disease surveillance, to communicate to the public and to be trusted. Community systems for health. One thing we have learned, particularly through the fight against HIV, is that if you haven't, you can't do the eradication of diseases to people. You need the people in communities engaged and shaping what is happening. I think many countries didn't really listen to that or take that on board when it came to the COVID response and went back into a kind of command and control mode 
which didn't actually work very well. Because if you don't have the buy-in of communities, you won't get the kind of pervasive changes in behavior and ways of dealing with an infectious disease that you need when you're faced with such a formidable adversary. All this comes together for the Global Fund this year in the context of our replenishment. We refinance on a three-year cycle. So in 2019, the Global Fund raised $14 billion through a replenishment conference hosted by President Macron. This year, we are going to be hosted by President Biden in the United States, and we are targeting to raise $18 billion. So that's a 29% increase for those mathematicians around. And you may say, well, wh wh where did that number come from? Isn't that a bit ambitious given fiscal constraints and competing demands and all that sort of stuff? It's quite, at one level, it's quite simple, which is that we didn't pluck the number from the air. We worked with all our technical partners, UNH, WHO, and so on, and modeled what it would actually take to get back on track towards the global targets. And in a way, it shouldn't surprise at all that if we've gone backwards or stalled for two years and 2030 as a deadline hasn't moved, we've got to achieve a steeper reduction in death and mortality, and that will take more money. And 18 billion actually represents the same percentage of the total modeled resource need as 14 billion did in 2019. But it's not just about the money. To beat diseases like HIV, TB and malaria, you have to tackle the underlying socio-political, socio-economic determinants. I'm talking about human rights related barriers to people accessing health services, whether that's for men who have sex with men or sex workers or drug users, transgender, which persist and actually in some countries during COVID have got worse. It's about tackling gender related inequalities. As Grace can tell you in a much more compelling way than I can, in many parts of the world, the people who are most vulnerable to being infected by HIV are young women and girls. But it's not just with HIV. Malaria, as I mentioned, for adults, the mortality rates are highest among young pregnant women. But more fundamentally, not just human rights related and gender inequalities, there is a range of inequities. There is a, there's a phenomenon which we've seen again, I think, with COVID-19, which is that pandemics have a nasty way of discovering the flaws in our societies and kind of exploiting them and making them worse. We've seen this with HIV, TB, and malaria. We've seen this with COVID-19. And this underpins another aspect of the way we're thinking about the next phase of our mission, which is all around building more people-centered, more inclusive systems for health. And I deliberately say, systems for health rather than health systems because a system for health is a somewhat broader a broader concept it includes the communities it includes the role of education that ends up delivering better health for people so this is a year where there's a lot else going on we have the war in ukraine we have natural disasters, Cyclone Anna in Malawi. But it would be a tragedy if we all too quickly in the rich countries of the world forget what we've just been through and lose sight of what many of the poorest and most vulnerable communities have been suffering all the time, which is the corrosive burden of infectious disease. 
And while we are all, I think, acutely aware right now of um, what happens, what the economic downside is of an infectious disease like COVID-19, I think we sometimes underestimate the economic upside of freeing communities from that burden. But actually, if you take malaria, for example, there's plenty of analysis that shows that when you take rural villages and you free them from high burden malaria, you immediately see improvements in educational attainment, agricultural productivity, and pretty well every indices of socioeconomic development. So I'll stop here and hand over to Mark and then directly to Grace. Directly to Grace. Um, but um, I would just close quickly by talking about Ukraine for a second. A Ukraine, from a perspective of a global health person, is a reminder of the uh, nasty relationship between conflict and disease. Uh, we, we are already putting emergency funding uh, into uh, Ukraine, but we will see we will see negative consequences for HIV and TB as a result of the conflict. We we know that's going to happen, as we have seen in other places in Ethiopia, in Myanmar, in various parts of the world. And actually, it works the other way as well. Is disease by undermining trust, by undermining social cohesion, can also can also create fertile territory for conflict. I don't want to end on a depressing note, though. If we succeed in, when we succeed in raising $18 billion um, in the seventh replenishment, the opportunity to make a transformational difference to some of these poorest and most vulnerable communities in the world is massive. To give you one number, at the moment, about two and a half million people a year of are dying of HIV, TB and malaria. By 2026, we believe, and it's not just us, but our technical partners, that we could get that number to under a million. A million is still too many, but it would be a massive achievement to reduce the death toll by that much. So thank you, and I'll hand over to Grace. Thank you, everyone. Um, my fellow distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, my fellow young people, it's really an honor to be with you today. My name is Grace Ngulue. I'm 26 years old. I'm from Blante, Malawi. In my day-to-day -day life, I support young people living with newly diagnosed with HIV and I provide psychosocial support to young people who are struggling with their HIV status. As a young woman living with HIV, I have faced several challenges like stigma and discrimination, which has taught me on how to be resilient. My experience drove me to advocate for young people living with HIV, especially adolescent girls and young women with similar challenges. I work as a peer supporter for young people living with HIV for the past six years, attached to the National Association for Young People Living with HIV in Malawi. I have faced stigma and, and struggled to cope with my HIV status. I have also witnessed first-hand challenge that other young people in remote areas are facing to access services. For example, during this COVID-19 pandemic, one of the adolescent girls and young women was sent back, was sent away because she didn't put on a face mask. Luckily enough, I was at the healthy facility. She called me and I was able to find her a face mask and assisted her to get into the facility to get her prescription. This motivates me to support young people to access to easily access services and information, especially adolescent girls and young women living with HIV for whom stigma and judgment are unusual regular occurrences 
when they want to access SRH services, when they also want to engage in the decision making spaces. The Global Fund has provided pockets of funds to support capacity building programs for young people by young people and youth led organizations. But is, this is nowhere near enough to make a real difference. The Global Fund Youth Council and the Have Voice Fund are two concrete examples of how the Global Fund is working with civil society organizations, community partners, youth led organizations to support the engagement and empowerment of young people in critical, in critical decision making spaces. But this is just a tip of iceberg to real engagement. We need more engagement and we see all of this as a great start to put young people at the center at the Global Fund. The Global Fund has invested in AGYW programs in 13 priority countries to ensure that girls are living positively with HIV and some countries have invested in ensuring that girls stay in school. We hope that in the next strategy cycle, we can do more to ensure that all these countries have received funds from the Global Fund and are addressing gender inequalities to uphold the rights of adults and girls and young women in all countries. I value my role in the Global Fund Youth Council and I appreciate the Global Fund Secretary and team for engaging us. Often youth-led organizations, especially the vulnerable and key population organizations like the men having sex with men, transgender, young people living with HIV, networks of young women living with HIV are not properly funded. Funding such organizations will, will enable these organizations to actively engage in shaping and addressing responses to the challenge that they face. A proper funding of these organizations will also allow them to properly represent in different decision making spaces. Many global fund donors recommend a strong representation for young women. We need to be participating as partners, not just as beneficiaries. We want a, we want a sustainable and enabling environment that protects the basic and enduring rights of all people especially from key populations who are young to access services without fear of reprisal. We feel safe when we walk into a healthy care facility, and this is not always the case. The Global Fund needs to make sure that it is, safe in, it is funding safe and friendly environment. We need a stronger, resilient and sustainable, sustainable system for health and robust investment towards HIV. This, this means that I shall be able to access healthy care services when I need it. I don't have to jump through hoops of fire to get what I need as a young woman. We need a stronger community systems for health solidly embedded in the national health system. We have been doing the job for so long with no validation or payment. This must change. We need a a stronger global solidarity and mutual accountability. What happens to me in Malawi does not matter what happens in Ireland. And COVID has shown us this, none of us is free until all we are free. We need a bigger high level political commitment and leadership. We want to see the global fund showing communities the funds and we need even more investments in HYW programs. We need to ensure the continuous enrollment and retention of girls to complete secondary and tertiary education. We need research generated achievements on what works and what needs to be abandoned. We need, we need, an individ, we need individuals, actors of the global partnership to come together once again to fight for what counts. We have come a long way in fight against HIV, TB and malaria. We all are waiting for the 2030 goal to be achieved. We can never forget about investing in HIV treatment care and support to ensure that all people living with HIV are living a healthy life. I believe it is time for the Global Fund Partnership, including donors and implementing countries to put in more efforts in terms of HIV cure and vaccine. The world was able to come up with the COVID-19 vaccine in a year. 
so you can see what people can do if they want to. Funds for civil society organizations, community-based organizations, faith-based organizations are shrinking. It is therefore important to support these organizations in more sustainable way to advocate for increased domestic resource mobilization and use leverage to influence the government. I call on the Global Fund Partnership, emphasis on partnership to maintain committed to the fight against HIV, TB and malaria and address all inequalities in order to end, in order to end cultural barriers to access inequitable health systems. It feels the we feel the effect of this as young people even more harshly for young women. We need to end gender-based violence amongst young adults and girls and young women. We need to end stigma and discrimination of marginalized groups and key population, especially those of us who are young and less voice to hold implementers accountable. We all have the responsibility in ending HIV. Thank you. Thank you both. If you wouldn't mind taking. So thank you all. Um, the floor is open for questions. If you have questions, just raise your hand and we will bring microphones to you. Um, I'm going to take the moderator uh, privilege and ask a question first. I, both of you spoke about uh, the importance of um, you know the the patient, the person you know, not just using your your phrase, not just using a command and control structure. You spoke very much about uh, about the stigma that you have felt. Uh, what COVID nineteen has shown us is that the command and control doesn't work super well, but it has also shown us that there, uh, perhaps more than previously, uh, there has been also a, a an active resistance to you know things that work. Um, what can we learn from HIV, TB, and malaria for communicating science when there's that sort of active resistance? All right, thank you very much. Um, what I can say is um, we should not relax. The more we relax, the more we can increase the HIV prevalence rate. I remember I was talking to Diane, like for example in Malawi, I've been working with young children who are newly diagnosed with HIV. From December to now, I have registered over 25 young children, under five children, just in one district. So imagine if we relax, how many young people will be affected by HIV? And during COVID-19, we have had an increase in rape cases. These young people have high chances of getting HIV. What can we do differently to make sure that we protect our girls and HIV pregnancy is going down? So that's why I always emphasize on coming up with an HIV vaccine or a cure so that we can at least reduce the HIV pregnancy rates. Just uh, building on uh, Grace's points. Um, to start with, I would say in the COVID-19 context, um, there isn't in most low and middle income countries really much. A, the big problem is not a problem of, say, vaccine hesitancy or resistance. It's the fact that the vaccines or the treatments aren't there. Um, uh, it's a bit of a luxury to have, um, in a sense, the option um, of having resistance. Um, but but also I think the lesson from uh, HIV, TB and malaria is that you need the voices of the communities. You, you, somebody like Grace telling other young people what works and doesn't work in treating when, you're, when you've been tested positive for HIV is a credible voice that will be listened to. Um, and the same goes for uh, approaches to, uh, if you want families to 
use their malaria bed nets in the most effective way. It's the voices of people trusted in the community that will be listened to. And in many countries, I don't think we did a very good job of that in, in COVID-19, right? We, we, we sort of ignored that basic truth, I think, and, and maybe relied too much on the notion that somehow or other, if we had authorities sort of saying what needed to be done, that everybody would believe it. Um, and that didn't work. And it didn't work for quite good reasons, because in some cases, the advice wasn't necessarily good. So it was difficult to tell when you were being told something that was correct and something that was incorrect. In other cases, the people who were giving you the advice clearly weren't taking it, which doesn't help for the credibility of the advice um, either. Uh, so I think there is a very important lesson there, which is that it's not just what the advice is, is but who's saying it um, that matters. Thank you. President? Well, thank you both. Can I ask what are the lessons we can learn from our experience of COVID-19 that are transferable uh, to the mission that you have um, in the Global um, Fund? Okay, I think firstly we can look at the way the COVID-19 vaccine came in. That's one of the lessons that it's possible that we can even come up with maybe an ART injectable drug or even an HIV vaccine. Someone who is just preventing shouldn't take ART every day, but maybe a vaccine could work for them. And even if you can look at the funds that were invested in COVID-19, if those funds were invested in HIV research, it would have made a difference because we are dealing with COVID-19, but we are forgetting about HIV, something that we are not yet done with. So. I, I think Grace has um, hit the nail on the head. A couple of things. One is, if we want to achieve big things scientifically, the world is incredibly capable. We can. It's just that sometimes we really don't want to as much as we may claim. or We don't put the resources behind it to make it happen. Um, the, a second big um, lesson for me is that a lot of the way the global health world works um, is too slow. Uh, our procedures for establishing the evidence basis for uh, new guidance and things like this can take months and months and months. And meanwhile, people are dying. Um, and our, pro our procedures for approving things um, can take uh, a long time. Now, on vaccines, we were able to collapse a lot of those things and show that we could move at very different speeds. Uh, that wasn't true across all aspects of it. I mean, if I take um, diagnostics, um, unless it's been published this afternoon, Diane. Um, five minutes ago. OK. WHO has just published guidance on self-testing. Now, I, I imagine quite a few of the people in this room or listening to this have been self-testing for quite a while. And that it's been in most high income countries a sort of core part of the response. But it's an example of how, you know, and very diligent, well-established processes for ensuring that guidance is well evidenced and things like this sometimes don't work um, because they're not responsive to the pace and nature of the situation. So I, I do think speed is is something that um, we <laughs> we should learn, um, and and I see it as well. I mean, if I take if I take examples from the world of um, HIV, TB and malaria, uh, rolling out dolutegravir uh, as a better treatment took too long. We still had people on inferior treatments with nasty side effects for far too long. Um, 
bedaquilin as a short course treatment for drug resistant TB. There are still countries in the world where that is not being used. And I think it's 10 years um, since bedaquilin was first approved. So I think we, we do need to get faster in terms of getting innovations into um, well, not into, but to the people who actually need them. Um, and, and that's true in a pandemic situation, but we should also be doing the same with HIV, TB, and malaria. Thank you, Professor Carroll. Thank you very much. And it's fantastic to hear Grace and Peter at the University of RCSI today. An awful lot of what we are talking about in clinical and surgical um, affairs is trusted leadership. And indeed, um, Peter has the voice of many global leaders and Grace is speaking on behalf of people perhaps who do not have a voice. How do we create trusted leadership that will allow people globally to buy into vaccines, treatment for disease, where it's killing people, but there are cures. So my question is, how can we enhance trusted leadership globally? I gotta say that one. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm gonna be sly here and, and get it back to Grace. Um, because I do think that there isn't um, there isn't a single answer here, right? And and the voices have to operate at many different levels um, because different people are going to listen in different ways to different messages, and and that's one of the reasons that say Grace's role on on something called her voice I think is uh, um, uh, really important important but but your question goes frankly to um the heart of a lot of the global issues we face right now um which is that uh you need people who can make complicated things clear without being so reductive that you actually lose um, the message and that are also prepared to tell uncomfortable truths about uh, the, the, the reality of the situation that we as communities, as individuals um, face. And I'm afraid COVID has demonstrated <laughs> probably more examples of that not happening um, than of it happening. So, for example, um, I've been, many of us sort of involved in the global health, the global response, have been very worried about the fact that we very quickly latched onto vaccines as a kind of silver bullet. Whereas it was fairly clear fairly early on that they were going to be our most powerful weapon, but they weren't going to be the only thing we needed to use. Um, and so that actually set up vaccines for a kind of, well, if they're not perfect, why would I take it type of um, uh, logic? Um, and yet, which hasn't been helpful. And it has also meant that the inequities we've seen in vaccine deployment are actually not as severe as the inequities we've seen in other forms of tools. So if I take diagnostics, um, if you look at the testing rates in most parts of Africa relative to uh, high income countries, they are shocking. In fact, in many parts of Africa, the truth is we have no idea what's going on. Um, so any of the statistics are pretty meaningless because there are so few tests available. And likewise, access to, say, oxygen. There have been people dying who with a little bit of oxygen support would not have died. Um, so 
a sort of textured, a more textured message that said we needed a more comprehensive response with a, a mix of tools um, kind of got lost. And I worry also that right now, where too many of our leaders are in the mode of sort of moving on from COVID. Um, and as I said in my opening remarks, you know, we may be lucky, um, but I don't think there's any inevitability of that. And um, if you think about the economic and political consequences of having another variant that was as transmissible as Omicron, but significantly more severe, um, I think that would have a, a really different, because people's, people's ability to kind of deal with that and economic and mental and social ability to deal with it would be very, very low. Um, and yet I worry that we're not, we're, we're being a bit rash and we're basically acting as if the best case scenario had a very, very high probability. And, you know, I'm not a virologist, but the ones I talk to all the time don't think it's that compelling. Um, but Grace, maybe you should talk, maybe, you could talk a bit about her voice and. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Peter. Um, I think in my presentation, I talked about having a high level political commitment and leadership. We want our leaders to be committed. And that's one of the, the aims of having our voice fund. We want adults and girls and young women to speak out for themselves to talk about their issues so that our leaders can be committed. Our leaders should know what the adults and girls want and they should do exactly how they want it because we want to be there as partners, not just as beneficiaries. We have been doing a lot for the past years, but we need a change. What change can we do? We need research generated achievements and we need to see what can we abandon and that's one of the things that we need. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Actually, can I take one question from the the um, the internet audience? Uh, this is related to what you just said. This is from Mac Darling Kobina. Uh, how does the Global Fund make an effort to prioritize key affected population leadership in interventions among that, those populations? I'm very happy to take it. Um, uh, it's a good question, and I, one fundamental principle um, that was embedded in the way the Global Fund was set up from the start is that communities affected by the diseases need to be involved in the conception, the design, the delivery of the services to benefit uh, in the way that Grace was describing in the context of adolescent girls and young women, but it, it would also be true for other affected populations. And you see that uh, at the level of the board. Uh, the Global Fund is quite unusual in the, uh, of our 20 voting board members, three of them are civil society seats. But you also see it at the level of the what's called the country coordinating mechanism, which is the uh, the stakeholder group within the country that defines the funding requests, i.e., that works out what the priorities are and what they want to use global fund money to do. And again, affected communities, civil society are part of that process. Does it work perfectly? Everywhere? No, of course it doesn't. Um, it's 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 a human system, and it sometimes gets sort of distorted by the pressures and particular contexts in which we operate in. Um, but I think there's a very strong commitment throughout the way the Global Fund works to this fundamental principle that the communities themselves have to be. Uh, a part of the solution.
I think just to add up on the CCN structure, it also allows young people because we we young people are also represented at the CCM. So the CCM it's like the overall decision making uh, structure for the global fund activities in country. So as young people, we also have a voice there and even the global fund, they were launching its strategy before they launched it. They make sure that young people uh, contribute towards it and they address their issues and issue, their issues should be made as a priority in their strategy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think this will we'll have time for this one last question. My, my question is also about prioritization and is slightly related, but when, when the Global Fund gets its next 18 billion, how does it prioritize across the three diseases? Uh, how, how, how do you get agreement? Presumably there's a lot of competing demands from the three parties. The great thing about having a highly inclusive uh, governance approach is that you get no shortage of opinions uh, on um, every matter and that things like we have what's called the global disease split, um, which is uh, a starting point allocation of resources across um, the three diseases. Um, and then what we have um, is an allocation methodology um, uh, to countries, which is based on disease burden and essentially the inverse of ability to pay. Um, so two countries with the same disease burden, the poorer one would get more. Um, and these methodologies are uh, debated at length and with passion at the board. Um, and um, and it's actually right that they should be debated at length and with passion because in a sense these are trade-offs where what's at stake is pe people's lives uh, and you know 18 billion may at one level seem like a lot of money um, but it's over three years six billion dollars a year it's over well over 100 countries if you compare it to the scale of the funds that have been used to fight COVID, it's a fraction. Uh, and um, and so there is a there is a process, and it's all completely transparent. And you can you can see all the details of the global disease split on online. You can see the methodology for allocating by countries. Um, uh, this is all sort of out there, um, uh, and it's not perfect, of course. Um, uh, because the perfect answer would be to have a lot more money. Um, uh, and there is and there's significant unmet need um, uh, across each of the diseases. But we also, I think, just need to be getting even smarter though. We need to be really focused on the efficiency. We need to be focused on things that um, solve multiple problems at once. Um, so if we can um, be equipping and training uh, lab technicians and labs themselves with molecular diagnostics and things on a kind of multi pathogen basis rather than with a single disease focus. Uh, we're doing a lot now, particularly learning from COVID around um, when you test somebody, testing them for multiple things at once. Um, rather than what has typically been the case is sort of asking a binary question, do they have HIV or not, or do they have malaria or not? There's a lot more um, multiple testing. Um, but we've got to continuously strive to find ways of making each dollar um, stretch um, further. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and I think just to add up on what Peter said, uh, can give an example for Malawi. 
um, I understand every country has its own needs. So when we are developing the funding request, we are always encouraged to use our national strategic plan. So from the national strategic plan, that's where the need is being identified. So whenever maybe they're making their decision of how much they need to give a country, most of the times they look at that national strategic plan and also they look up at the uh, challenges that the country is facing. I think that's what I can contribute. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, you all have a flight to catch, so we unfortunately have a hard stop. Um, Grace, Peter, thank you for your words today, the, for spending the hour with us, and thank you for all the work that you that you do every day uh, to fight HIV, TB, and malaria. Thank you very much. Thank you.